Hey, welcome to Legal Listening, where audio obiter is our thing. We're Carly and Zach, and we're so glad you're here with us today. Hey, just dropping in to say we're now on Patreon. If you want to support the project, head on over to patreon.com slash legal listening, where you can unlock some fun bonus content with me, Zach, and some special guests. Thanks so much for all your support. Okay, so today on the pod, we have um, the most fun decision ever, no notes, uh, the Queen and Jordan, (laughs) which is the 2016 decision, which talks about Section 11B, which is delay. Uh, So I know me and Zach have many opinions and thoughts on this, but before we get into that, quick and very important shout out to our special guest reader, Emmadeep Sembi, who is a criminal defense lawyer practicing out in BC. She also did a bunch of guest reading for our TRC project. She read the history section. Um, So special thanks to her. We could not have done this without you. It is certainly entirely too long that we were worried how we were ever going to get it recorded. And then Amandeep came along and recorded it for us. So special, special thanks to her. And with that, Zach, uh, what do we got here? Oh, boy. Jordan. (laughs) In, in, In the work that I do, there are two sections of the charter that I'm intimately familiar with. And it's and it's it's eleven B, and it's and it's eight. Really, that's what it is. It's it, those two areas of the charter which I have tons of experience in. But Jordan, very briefly, Jordan reset the framework for delay from uh, the case previously known as Morin. And so the short version of Jordan for all of our esteemed listeners, which if any of you practice criminal defense, either side of the bar, you need to know it. Oh, basically uh, the time regulatory. Yeah. As I say, I've written. Oh, in regulatory Jordan. too. I've written yes, a Jordan application. Right. So regulatory stuff too, but continue. Sorry, Zach, I cut you off. Yeah. So the, the short version is uh, if you're going to proceed by way of the Ontario Court of Justice or your provincial court, uh, it's the 18 month ceiling. If you're going to proceed by Superior Court of Justice or the equivalent in not Ontario, Queen's Bench is in other provinces. Yeah, Queen's Bench. Um, the presumptive ceiling is 30 months. And so the Jordan decision lays out the entire calculation for figuring out if delay in a trial was reasonable or unreasonable. And so the court in doing so created a framework where the trial of fact, the trial judge will look at the time since the person was arrested and all the things that happened in the case up until the date of the trial. And so there is basically one type of delay. And so delay is attributable to the crown. So for example, in a hypothetical scenario, the crown provides late disclosure that's critical to the function of the case, the delay would fall on the crown. There's nothing there's not defense delay that that's not how it works it's kind of the terminology that i'm used to saying but that's not legally how it comes out but there's elements that of things that happen that defense could do that sometimes delay the case for example if defense brings a last minute charter application on the eve of the trial the crown should have an opportunity to review read review and respond and in that circumstance that delay wouldn't be calculated in it so I would call it defense delay, but that's that's not the true legal representation of it. It's just the easiest way for me to explain it. So any of the defense lawyers listening, please, again, I'm not saying you're delaying the case. It's just how it makes sense in my first year lawyer brain. I promise I'll find the better terminology eventually. But for now, that's what I'm going to call it. So anyways, go. Jordan, super important. Yes. And what I know about Jordan <laughs> is that COVID uh, has messed up Jordan a whole bunch because of so many of the court closures, because of the pandemic. Um, So I know that you can be over the ceiling and argue that it has been exceptional circumstances, which is why you are over the ceiling. And I know that often um, COVID is being used as an exceptional circumstance, because what is a global pandemic, if not an exceptional circumstance? And like, we are not wading into like the morality of whether this is acceptable like we're not getting into that today we'd be here all day we're not doing that what we're saying is that like the way the decisions are playing out now in the pandemic is that COVID is being cited often by crowns at all levels as um an exceptional circumstance right like the pandemic is an exceptional circumstance and whether you know, as the pandemic moves on and courts reopen to certain degrees, whether that will still hold as we go forward is another matter entirely. But I know sort of like 
first and second wave decisions sort of were very heavily relying on the exceptional circumstance exception to the presumptive ceiling. Yeah. And I mean, there's there's a lot of other considerations that COVID has created in both um, helping delay issues be resolved, but also creating delay issues unto themselves. My first thought is, more beneficially that has helped reduce delay is the accessibility via Zoom. So you can have whole trials done without forcing people to drive to the courthouse or different jurisdictions. But the flip side of that is some matters require to be heard in person. And how do you get, especially like I'm thinking of larger, longer, like four week murder trial, like these high level ones where you need people to come in and testify and like getting the jury in and getting all the accused and all the witnesses, all of them in with vaccinations. Like there's a whole bunch of other considerations that come into doing a trial now that like could potentially make something that could have been like two weeks into four weeks now. So I don't know. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of decisions coming down and I don't think we're going to get an answer clearly ever. I don't think there's ever, I don't think there's going to be like a seminal SEC decision that comes down and says COVID equals x one way or another yeah. it's gonna be very case specific fact specific decisions so oh yeah well especially since like the way COVID has played out has obviously been very different in different provinces so it's just like yeah. you know if you're one set of provinces you're probably minimally worried about delay due to COVID and if you're another province to be not named um it's probably going to be closures for a very long time right because you have a high high amounts of COVID still so, yeah, um, it's certainly interesting. Jordan is one of those things that I think is going to be like the hottest of topics for the next forever. Just as long as the pandemic yeah. keeps going, we're going to be talking about Jordan because it's so important, especially in Ontario, where like the provincial offenses court is still mostly closed. Uh, it's going to be a whole time. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Jordan Jordan has always been or d- delay has always been since since the charter came in. Delay has always been one of these huge issues and not that i think jordan is the end of litigation on 11b generally i think it's just my prediction is we're going to see another potentially rework of jordan or maybe a clarification of jordan post pandemic at some point but who knows that's just me guessing yeah we're could def- be right could be wrong wouldn't bet on it yeah we're, we're definitely due so you know uh bet on that and in the meantime enjoy the queen and jordan This is Amandeep Sembi. I'm a criminal defense lawyer in Vancouver, and I'm going to be reading the case of the Queen and Jordan, heard on October 7th, 2015, at the Supreme Court of Canada. This case developed the new framework for Section 11b of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which guarantees the right of accused persons to be tried within a reasonable time. Introduction. Timely justice is one of the hallmarks of a free and democratic society. In the criminal law context, it takes on special significance. Section 11b of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms attests to this, in that it guarantees the right of accused persons, quote, to be tried within a reasonable time. Moreover, the Canadian public expects their criminal justice system to bring accused persons to trial expeditiously. As the months following a criminal charge become years, everyone suffers. Accused persons remain in a state of uncertainty, often in pretrial detention. Victims and their families, who in many cases have suffered tragic losses, cannot move forward with their lives, and the public, whose interest is served by promptly bringing those charged with criminal offenses to trial, is justifiably frustrated by watching years pass before trial occurs. An efficient criminal justice system is therefore of utmost importance. The ability to provide fair trials within a reasonable time is an indicator of the health and proper functioning of the system itself. The stakes are indisputably high. Our system, however, has come to tolerate excessive delays. The circumstances in this appeal are illustrative. Notwithstanding a delay of over four years in bringing a drug case of modest complexity to trial, both the trial judge and the court of appeal were of the view that the appellant was tried within a reasonable time. Their analyses are reflective of doctrinal and practical difficulties plaguing the current analytical framework governing Section 11b. These difficulties have fostered a culture of complacency within the system towards delay. A change of direction is therefore required. Below, we set out a new framework for applying Section 11b. At the center of this new framework is a presumptive ceiling on the time it should take to bring an accused person to trial. 18 months for cases going to trial in the provincial court, and 30 months for cases going to trial in the superior court. Of course, 
given the contextual nature of reasonableness, the framework counts for case-specific factors both above and below the presumptive ceiling. This framework is intended to focus the Section 11b analysis on the issues that matter and encourage all participants in the criminal justice system to cooperate in achieving reasonably prompt justice with a view to fulfilling Section 11b's important objectives. Applying this new framework, including its transitional features, we conclude that the appellant was not brought to trial within a reasonable time. We would allow the appeal, set aside his convictions, and direct stay of proceedings. Facts. The appellant, Mr. Jordan, was arrested in December 2008 following an RCMP investigation into a dial -a dope operation in Langley and Surrey, British Columbia. He was eventually charged with nine other co-accused on a 14-count information alleging various offenses relating to possession and trafficking. Mr. Jordan remained in custody until February 2009 when he was released under strict house arrest and other restrictive bail conditions. The 10 co-accused made numerous appearances through the early months of 2009 as they obtained counsel, made their elections, and coordinated schedules. By May 2009, all counsel had agreed that the preliminary inquiry would require approximately four days, and it was eventually set for May 13th, 14th, 17th, and 18th of 2010. Several of the co-accused entered guilty pleas or were severed from the information. By the time the preliminary inquiry commenced, there were five co-accused left on the information, including Mr. Jordan. At the preliminary inquiry, it quickly became apparent that the initial time estimate of four days was too low. Crown counsel advised the preliminary inquiry judge that the Crown would be able to present all of the evidence against the four accused, but that the Crown would require significantly more court time to present the, quote, mountain of evidence, end quote, it had in respect of Mr. Jordan. The party sought and obtained continuation dates throughout 2010 and into 2011. In May 2011, Mr. Jordan, along with two co-accused, was committed to stand trial on all 14 counts. The preliminary inquiry, which ended up taking nine days of court time, had taken a full year to complete. It was now two and a half years since Mr. Jordan had been charged. Following committal, the matter moved to the British Columbia Supreme Court. Crown counsel estimated that six weeks would be required for trial, and the trial was set for the first available six-week block in September 2012. A new Crown counsel took over the file in July 2011 and wrote to Mr. Jordan's counsel advising of her estimate that only two to three weeks would be needed to present the Crown's case, and offering to seek earlier trial dates. Mr. Jordan's counsel did not respond to this offer. Later, in December 2011, one of the remaining two co-accused was severed from the information. Only Mr. Jordan and one co-accused remained. As Mr. Jordan awaited trial, his liberty was restricted. He spent two months in custody following his arrest in December 2008, which was followed by close to four years of restrictive bail conditions. However, in July 2011, Mr. Jordan was convicted of prior drug charges and was sentenced to a 15-month conditional sentence order, quote, CSO, end quote, which he served until October 2012. The conditions of the CSO were similar to the bail conditions Mr. Jordan was under for the charges at issue in this appeal. Therefore, for 15 months of the delay, Mr. Jordan's liberty was restricted by both the bail conditions and the CSO. At the start of his trial in September 2012, Mr. Jordan brought an application for a stay of proceedings, alleging a breach of his Section 11b right to be tried within a reasonable time. This application was dismissed. The trial was adjourned and it eventually concluded in February 2013, with his conviction on five drug-related offenses. The total delay from Mr. Jordan's charges to the conclusion of the trial was 49.5 months. Judgments below. A. British Columbia Supreme Court, 2012, BCSC, 1735. The trial judge found that the delay in bringing this matter to trial was not unreasonable and declined to enter a stay of proceedings. In concluding there was no Section 11b breach, he applied the framework from this court's decision in R. V. Moran, including the guidelines set out in it for how much institutional delay is generally tolerable. The trial judge found that the inherent time requirements for this case were 10.5 months. He also found that, of the total delay, four months incurred when Mr. Jordan changed counsel and requested an adjournment of his trial were attributed to the defense, and two months were attributable to the Crown. The bulk of the delay, 32.5 months, was attributable to institutional delay, of which 19 months occurred at the provincial court 
and 13.5 months occurred at the BC Supreme Court. This was, as the trial judge noted, well outside the Moran guidelines for tolerable institutional delay of 8 to 10 months in the provincial court and 6 to 8 months in the superior court. However, the trial judge held that institutional delay should be given less weight than crown delay in the final balancing. The trial judge then considered the issue of prejudice. He reasoned that if the institutional delay had been within the Moran guidelines, the trial would have concluded by May 2011. Most of the additional delay coincided with the term of Mr. Jordan's CSO. The trial judge therefore found that Mr. Jordan's liberty interest was not significantly prejudiced by the delay. While Mr. Jordan's security of the person was affected, any prejudice was minimized by the fact that he was facing other outstanding charges for much of the delay. Finally, he found no prejudice to Mr. Jordan's right to make full answer and defense because the Crown's case did not depend on the memory of witnesses. The trial judge balanced all of the factors and concluded that Mr. Jordan's Section 11b right had not been infringed, due primarily to the fact that Mr. Jordan did not suffer significant prejudice. B. British Columbia Court of Appeal Mr. Jordan appealed. He argued that the trial judge erred in his assessment of prejudice and gave inadequate weight to the excessive institutional delay. The Court of Appeal found that the trial judge did not err in his attribution of the delay or in his weighing of the institutional delay. Further, the trial judge's determination on prejudice was a finding of fact that was entitled to deference. Finally, the trial judge did not err by declining to infer prejudice based on the length of the delay alone. The appeal was dismissed. Analysis A. The right to be tried within a reasonable time is important to individuals and society as a whole. As we have said, the right to be tried within a reasonable time is central to the administration of Canada's system of criminal justice. It finds expression in the familiar maxim, quote, justice delayed is justice denied, end quote. An unreasonable delay denies justice to the accused, victims and their families, and the public as a whole. Trials within a reasonable time are an essential part of our criminal justice system's commitment to treating presumptively innocent accused persons in a matter that protects their interests in liberty, security of the person, and a fair trial. Liberty is engaged because a timely trial means an accused person will spend as little time as possible held in pretrial custody or living in the community under release conditions. Security of the person is impacted because a long delayed trial means prolonging the stress, anxiety, and stigma an accused may suffer. Fair trial interests are affected because the longer a trial is delayed, the more likely it is that some accused will be prejudiced in mounting a defense, owing to faded memories unavailability of witnesses, or lost or degraded evidence. At the same time, we recognize that some accused persons who are in fact guilty of their charges are content to see their trials delayed for as long as possible. Indeed, there are incentives for them to remain passive in the face of delay. Accused persons may seek to avoid responsibility for their crimes by embracing delay in the hope that the case against them will fall apart or they will obtain a stay of proceedings. This operates to the detriment of the public and of the system of justice as a whole. Section 11b was not intended to be a sword to frustrate the ends of justice, Moran at pages 801 to 802. Of course, the interests protected by Section 11b extend beyond those of accused persons. Timely trials impact other people who play a role in and are affected by criminal trials, as well as the public's confidence in the administration of justice. Victims of crime and their families may be devastated by criminal acts and therefore have a special interest in timely trials. R.B. Askov at pages 1220 to 1221. Delay aggravates victim suffering, preventing them from moving on with their lives. Timely trials allow victims and witnesses to make the best possible contribution to the trial and minimize the, quote, worry and frustration they experience until they have given their testimony, end quote. Askov at page 1220. Repeated delays interrupt their personal, employment, or business activities, creating inconvenience that may present a disincentive to their participation. Last but certainly not least, timely trials are important to maintaining overall public confidence in the administration of justice. As Justice McLaughlin, as she then was, put in Moran, quote, Delays are of consequence not only to the accused, but may affect the public interest in the prompt and fair administration of justice, end quote, page 810. Crime is of serious concerns to all members of the community. Unreasonable delay leaves the innocent in limbo and the guilty unpunished, thereby offending the community's sense of justice. See Askoff at page 1220. Failure, quote, 
To deal fairly, quickly, and efficiently with criminal trials inevitably leads to the community's frustration with the justice system and eventually to a feeling of contempt for court procedures, end quote, page 1221. Extended delays undermine public confidence in the system, and public confidence is essential to the survival of the system itself. As, quote, a fair and balanced criminal justice system simply cannot exist without the support of the community, end quote, Askoff at page 1221. Canadians, therefore, rightly expect a system that can deliver quality justice in a reasonably efficient and timely manner. Fairness and timeliness are sometimes thought to be in mutual tension, but this is not so. As D. Jeffrey Cowper QC wrote in a report commissioned by the BC Justice Reform Initiative, the widely perceived conflict between justice and efficiency goals is not based in reason or sound analysis. The real experience of the system is that both must be pursued in order for each to be realized. They are, in practice, interdependent. A criminal justice system for the 21st century 2012 at page 75. In short, timely trials further the interests of justice. They ensure that the system functions in a fair and efficient manner. Tolerating trials after long delays does not. Swift, predictable justice, quote, the most powerful deterrent of crime, end quote, is seriously undermined and in some cases rendered illusionary by delayed trials. B. Problems with the current framework. While this court has always recognized the importance of the right to a trial within a reasonable time, in our view, developments since Moran demonstrate that the system has lost its way. The framework set out in Moran has given rise to both doctrinal and practical problems, contributing to a culture of delay and complacency towards it. The Moran frameworks requires courts to balance four factors in determining whether a breach of Section 11b has occurred. 1. The length of the delay. 2. Defense waiver. 3. The reasons for the delay, including the inherent needs of the case, defense delay, crown delay, institutional delay, and other reasons for delay. And 4. Prejudice to the accused's interest in liberty, security of the person, and a fair trial. Prejudice can be either actual or inferred from the length of the delay. Institutional delay, in particular, is assessed against a set of guidelines developed by this court in Moran. 8 to 10 months in the provincial court and a further six to eight months after committal for trial in the Superior Court. The Moran guidelines reflect the fact that resources are finite and there must accordingly be some tolerance for institutional delay. Institutional delay within or close to the guidelines has generally been considered to be reasonable. This framework suffers from a number of related doctrinal shortcomings. First, its application is highly unpredictable. It has been interpreted so as to permit endless flexibility making it difficult to determine whether a breach has occurred. The absence of a consistent standard has turned Section 11b into something of a dice roll and has led to the proliferation of lengthy and often complex Section 11b applications, thereby further burdening the system. Second, as the parties and interveners point out, the treatment of prejudice has become one of the most fraught areas in the Section 11b jurisprudence. It is confusing, hard to prove, and highly subjective. As to the confusion prejudice has caused, Courts have struggled to distinguish between actual and inferred prejudice, and attempts to draw this distinction have led to apparent inconsistencies, such as that prejudice might be inferred even when the evidence shows that the accused suffered no actual prejudice. Further, actual prejudice can be quite difficult to establish, particularly prejudice to security of the person or fair trial interests. Courts have also found that, quote, it may not always be easy, end quote, to distinguish between prejudice stemming from the delay versus the chart itself, R.V. Pitskolny at para 43. And even if sufficient evidence is adduced, the interpretation of that evidence is a highly subjective enterprise. Despite this confusion, prejudice has, as this case demonstrates, become an important if not determinative factor. Long delays are considered, quote, reasonable if the accused is unable to demonstrate significant actual prejudice to his or her protected interests. This is a problem because the accused and the public's interests in a trial within a reasonable time do not necessarily turn on how much suffering an accused has endured. Delayed trials may also cause prejudice to the administration of justice. Third, the Moran framework requires a retrospective inquiry, since the analysis of delay arises only after the delay has been incurred. Courts and parties are operating within a framework that is designed not to prevent delay, but only to redress or not redress it. As a consequence, they are not motivated to manage, quote, each case in advance to achieve future compliance with consistent standards, end quote. Courts are instead left to pick up the pieces once the delay has transpired. This, after-the-fact review of past delay, is understandably frustrating for trial judges, 
who have only one remedial tool at their disposal, a stay of proceedings. It is therefore unsurprising that courts have occasionally strained in applying the Moran framework to avoid a stay. The retrospective analysis required by Moran also encourages parties to quibble over rationalizations for vast periods of pretrial delay. Here, for example, the Crown argues that the trial judge erred in characterizing most of the delay as Crown or institutional delay. Had he assessed it properly, the argument goes, he would have attributed only five to eight months as Crown or institutional delay, as opposed to the 34.5 months. Competing after-the-fact explanations allow for potentially limitless variations in permissible delay. As the intervener, the Criminal Lawyers Association Ontario submits, quote, boundless flexibility is incompatible with the concept of a charter right and has proven to serve witnesses, victims, defendants, and the justice system's reputation poorly, end quote. Finally, the Moran framework is unduly complex. The minute accounting it requires might fairly be considered the bane of every trial judge's existence. Although Justice Cromwell warned in R.V. Godin that courts must avoid failing to see the forest for the trees, paragraph 18, courts and litigants have often done just that. Each day of the proceedings from charge to trial is argued about, accounted for, and explained away. This micro-counting is inefficient, relies on judicial, quote, guesstimations, end quote, and has been applied in a way that allows for tolerance of ever-increasing delay. In sum, from a doctrinal perspective, the Section 11b framework is too unpredictable, too confusing, and too complex. It has itself become a burden on already overburdened trial courts. These doctrinal problems have contributed to problems in practice. As we have observed, a culture of complacency towards delay has emerged in the criminal justice system. See example, Alberta Justice and Solicitor General, Criminal Justice Division, injecting a sense of urgency, a new approach to delivering justice in serious and violent criminal cases, a report by G. Lepp, April 2013. Cowper at page 4, P.J. Lesage and M. Code, Report of the Review of Large and Complex Criminal Case Procedures, 2008, at page 15. Department of Justice Canada, The Final Report on Early Case Consideration of the Steering Committee on Justice Efficiencies and Access to the Justice System, 2006, at pages 5 to 6. Unnecessary procedures and adjournments, inefficient practices, and inadequate institutional resources are accepted as the norm and give rise to ever-increasing delay. This culture of delay, quote, causes great harm to public confidence in the justice system, end quote, Lesagian Code at page 16. It, quote, rewards the wrong behavior, frustrates the well-intentioned, makes frequent users of the system cynical and disillusioned, and frustrates the rehabilitative goals of the system, end quote, Cowper at page 48. The Moran framework does not address this culture of complacency. Delay is condemned or rationalized at the back end. As a result, participants in the justice system, police, crown counsel, defense counsel, courts, provincial legislatures, and parliament are not encouraged to take preventative measures to address inefficient practices and resourcing problems. Some courts, with the cooperation of counsel, have undertaken commendable efforts to change courtroom culture, maximize efficiency, and minimize delay thereby showing that it is possible to do better. Some legislative changes and government initiatives have also been taken. In many cases, however, much remains to be done. Aggravating the tolerance for delay is the increased complexity of pretrial and trial processes since Moran. New offenses, procedures, obligations on the Crown and police, and legal tests have emerged. Many of them put a premium on fairness, reasonableness, and a fact-specific analysis. They take time. They also take up judges, courtrooms, and other resources. Complexity is sometimes unavoidable in order to achieve fairness or ensure that the state lives up to its constitutional obligations. But the quality of justice does not always increase proportionally to the length and complexity of a trial. Unnecessary procedural steps and inefficient advocacy have the opposite effect, weighing down the entire system. A criminal proceeding does not take place in a vacuum. Each procedural step or motion that is improperly taken, or takes longer than it should, along with each charge that should not have been laid or pursued, deprives other worthy litigants of timely access to the courts. The intervener, Attorney General of Alberta, submits that a change in courtroom culture is needed. This submission echoes former Chief Justice Lemaire's two-decade-old call for participants in the justice system to, quote, find ways to retain a fair process that can achieve practical results in a reasonable time and reasonable expense. We agree. And along with other participants in the justice system, This court has a role to play in changing courtroom culture and facilitating a more efficient criminal justice system, thereby protecting the right to trial within a reasonable time. 
We accept Mr. Jordan's invitation, which was echoed by the Criminal Lawyers Association, Ontario, the British Columbia Civil Liberties Association, and Mr. Williamson in the companion appeal of R.V. Williamson to revise the Section 11b analysis. While departing from precedent of this court, quote, is a step not to be lightly undertaken, end quote, Ontario Attorney General versus Fraser at paragraph 56, as we have explained, quote, there are compelling reasons to do so, end quote, R.V. Henry at paragraph 44. A new framework for Section 11b applications. A. Summary. At the heart of the new framework is a ceiling beyond which delay is presumptively unreasonable. The presumptive ceiling is set at 18 months for cases going to trial in the provincial court and at 30 months for cases going to trial in the superior court or cases going to trial in the provincial court after a preliminary inquiry. If the total delay from the charge to the actual or anticipated end of trial, minus defense delay, exceeds the ceiling, then the delay is presumptively unreasonable. To rebut this presumption, the Crown must establish the presence of exceptional circumstances. If it cannot, the delay is unreasonable and a stay will follow. If the total delay from the charge to the actual or anticipated end of trial, minus defense delay or a period of delay attributable to exceptional circumstances, falls below the presumptive ceiling, then the onus is on the defense to show that the delay is unreasonable. To do so, the defense must establish that 1. It took meaningful steps that demonstrate a sustained effort to expedite the proceedings, and 2. The case took markedly longer than it reasonably should have. We expect stays beneath the ceiling to be rare and limited to clear cases. B. The presumptive ceiling. The most important feature of the new framework is that it sets a ceiling beyond which delay is presumptively unreasonable. For cases going to trial in the provincial court, the presumptive ceiling is 18 months from the charge to the actual or anticipated end of trial. For cases going to trial in the superior court, the presumptive ceiling is 30 months from the charge to the actual or anticipated end of trial. We note the 30-month ceiling would also apply to cases going to trial in the provincial court after a preliminary inquiry. As we will discuss, defense waived or caused delay does not count in calculating whether the presumptive ceiling has been reached, that is, such delay is to be discounted. A presumptive ceiling is required in order to give meaningful direction to the state on its constitutional obligations and to those who play an important role in ensuring that the trial concludes within a reasonable time. Court administration, the police, crown prosecutors, accused persons, and their counsel and judges. It is also intended to provide some assurance to accused persons, to victims and their families, to witnesses, and to the public that Section 11b is not a hollow promise. While the presumptive ceiling will enhance analytical simplicity and foster constructive incentives, it is not the end of the exercise. As we will explain in greater detail, compelling case-specific factors remain relevant to assessing the reasonableness of a period of delay both above and below the ceiling. Obviously, reasonableness cannot be captured by a number alone, which is why the new framework is not solely a function of time. Contrary to what our colleague Justice Cromwell asserts, we do not depart from the concept of reasonableness. We simply adopt a different view of how reasonableness should be assessed. In setting the presumptive ceiling, we were guided by a number of considerations. First, it takes as a starting point the Morin guidelines. In Morin, this court set 8 to 10 months as a guide for institutional delay in the provincial court, and an additional 6 to 8 months as a guide for institutional delay in the superior court following an accused committal for trial. Thus, under Morin, a total of 14 to 18 months was the measure for proceedings involving both the provincial court and the superior court. Second, the presumptive ceiling also reflects additional time to account for the other factors that can reasonably contribute to the time it takes to prosecute a case. These factors include the inherent time requirements of the case and the increased complexity of criminal cases since Morin. In this way, the ceiling takes into account the significant role that process now plays in our criminal justice system. Third, although prejudice will no longer play an explicit role in the Section 11b analysis, it informs the setting of the presumptive ceiling. Once the ceiling is breached, we presume that accused persons will have suffered prejudice to their charter-protected liberty, security of the person, and fair trial interests. As this court wrote in Moran, quote, prejudice to the accused can be inferred from prolonged delay, end quote, page 801, see Godin at paragraph 37. This is not, we stress, a rebuttable presumption. Once the ceiling is breached, an absence of actual prejudice cannot convert an unreasonable delay into a reasonable one. 
Fourth, the presumptive ceiling has an important public interest component. The clarity and assurance it provides will build public confidence in the administration of justice. We also make this observation about the presumptive ceiling. It is not an aspirational target. Rather, it is the point at which delay becomes presumptively unreasonable. The public should expect that most cases can and should be resolved before reaching the ceiling. For this reason, as we will explain, the Crown bears the onus of justifying delays that exceed the ceiling. It is also for this reason that an accused may, in clear cases, still demonstrate that his or her right to be tried within a reasonable time has been infringed, even before the ceiling has been breached. There is little reason to be satisfied with a presumptive ceiling on trial delay set at 18 months for cases going to trial in the provincial court and 30 months for cases going to trial in the superior court. This is a long time to wait for justice, but the ceiling reflects the realities we currently face. We may have to revisit these numbers and the considerations that inform them in the future. Our colleague, Justice Cromwell, misapprehends the effect of the presumptive ceiling, asserting that this framework, quote, reduces reasonableness to two numerical ceilings, end quote, paragraph 254. As we will explain in greater detail, this is clearly not so. The presumptive ceiling marks the point at which the burden shifts from the defense to prove that the delay was unreasonable to the Crown to justify the length of time the case has taken. As our colleague acknowledges, pursuant to our framework, quote, the judge must look at the circumstances of the particular case at hand, unquote, in assessing the reasonableness of a delay, paragraph 301. We now turn to discussing the various case-specific factors that must be accounted for both above and below the presumptive ceiling. C. Accounting for defense delay. Application of this framework, as under the Morin framework, begins with calculating the total delay from the charge to the actual or anticipated end of trial. Once that is determined, delay attributable to the defense must be subtracted. The defense should not be allowed to benefit from its own delay causing conduct. As Justice Sapinka wrote in Morin, quote, the purpose of Section 11b is to expedite trials and minimize prejudice and not to avoid trials on the merits, end quote, page 802. Defense delay has two components. The first is delay waived by the defense, Ascoff at pages 1228-29, Morin at pages 790-91. Waiver can be explicit or implicit, but in either case, it must be clear and unequivocal. The accused must have full knowledge of his or her rights, as well as the effect waiver will have on those rights. However, as in the past, quote, in considering the issue of waiver in the context of Section 11b, it must be remembered that it is not the right itself which is being waived, but merely the inclusion of specific periods in the overall assessment of reasonableness, end quote. R.B. Conway, per Justice Lurie de Bay, at page 1686. Accused persons, sometimes either before or during their preliminary hearing, wish to re-elect from a superior court trial to a provincial court trial for legitimate reasons. To do so, the Crown's consent must be obtained. Criminal Code RSC 1985, Chapter C 46, Section 561. Of course, it would generally be open to the Crown to ask the accused to waive the delay stemming from the re-election as a condition of its consent. The second component of defense delay is delay caused solely by the conduct of the defense. This kind of defense delay comprises, quote, those situations where the accused's acts either directly cause the delay or the acts of the accused are shown to be a deliberate and calculated tactic employed to delay the trial, end quote, as Koff at page 1227 to 28. Deliberate and calculated defense tactics aimed at causing delay, which include frivolous applications and requests, are the most straightforward examples of defense delay. Trial judges should generally dismiss such applications and requests the moment it becomes apparent they are frivolous. As another example, the defense will have directly caused the delay if the court and the Crown are ready to proceed, but the defense is not. The period of delay resulting from the unavailability will be attributed to the defense. However, periods of time during which the court and the Crown are unavailable will not constitute defense delay, even if defense counsel is also unavailable. This should discourage unnecessary inquiries into defense counsel availability at each appearance. Beyond defense unavailability, it will of course be open to trial judges to find that other defense actions or conduct have caused delay. See for example R. V. Elliott at paragraphs 175 to 82. To be clear, defense actions legitimately taken to respond to the charges fall outside the ambit of defense delay. For example, the defense must be allowed preparation time even where the court and the Crown are ready to proceed. In addition, defense applications and requests that are not frivolous will also generally not count against the defense. We have already accounted for procedural requirements in setting the ceiling. 
and such a deduction would run contrary to the accused's right to make full answer and defense. While this is by no means an exact science, first instance judges are uniquely positioned to gauge the legitimacy of defense actions. To summarize, as a first step, total delay must be calculated and defense delay must be deducted. Defense delay comprises delays waived by the defense and delays caused solely or directly by the defense's conduct. Defense actions legitimately taken to respond to the charges do not constitute defense delay. The next step of the analysis depends upon whether the remaining delay, that is, the delay which was not caused by the defense, is above or below the presumptive ceiling. D. Above the ceiling, presumptively unreasonable delay. Delay minus defense delay that exceeds the ceiling is presumptively unreasonable. The Crown may rebut this presumption by showing that the delay is reasonable because of the presence of exceptional circumstances. Exceptional circumstances. Exceptional circumstances lie outside the Crown's control in the sense that 1. They are reasonably unforeseen or reasonably unavoidable and 2. Crown Council cannot reasonably remedy the delays emanating from those circumstances once they arise. So long as they meet this definition, they will be considered exceptional. They need not meet a further hurdle of being rare or entirely uncommon. It is not enough for the Crown, once the ceiling is breached, to point to a past difficulty. It must also show that it took reasonable available steps to avoid and address the problem before the delay exceeded the ceiling. This may include prompt resort to case management processes to seek the assistance of the court, or seeking assistance from the defense to streamline evidence or issues for trial, or to coordinate pretrial applications, or resorting to any other appropriate procedural means. The Crown, we emphasize, is not required to show that the steps it took were ultimately successful, rather, just that it took reasonable steps in an attempt to avoid the delay. It is obviously impossible to identify in advance all circumstances that may qualify as, quote, exceptional, unquote for the purposes of adjudicating a Section 11b application. Ultimately, the determination of whether circumstances are exceptional will depend on the trial judge's good sense and experience. The list is not closed. However, in general, exceptional circumstances fall under two categories, discrete events and particularly complex cases. Commencing with the former, by way of illustration, it is to be expected that medical or family emergencies, whether on the part of the accused, important witnesses, counsel, or the trial judge, would generally qualify. Cases with an international dimension, such as cases requiring the extradition of an accused from a foreign jurisdiction, may also meet the definition. Discrete, exceptional events that arise at trial may also qualify and require some elaboration. Trials are not well-oiled machines. Unforeseeable or unavoidable developments can cause cases to quickly go awry, leading to delay. For example, a complainant might unexpectedly recant while testifying, requiring the Crown to change its case. In addition, if the trial goes longer than reasonably expected, even where the parties have made a good faith effort to establish realistic time estimates, then it is likely the delay was unavoidable and may therefore amount to an exceptional circumstance. Trial judges should be alive to the practical realities of trials, especially when the trial was scheduled to conclude below the ceiling, but, in the end, exceeded it. In such cases, the focus should be on whether the Crown made reasonable efforts to respond and to conclude the trial under the ceiling. Trial judges should also bear in mind that when an issue arises at trial close to the ceiling, it will be more difficult for the Crown and the Court to respond with a timely solution. For this reason, it is likely that unforeseeable or unavoidable delays occurring during trials that are scheduled to wrap up close to the ceiling will qualify as presenting exceptional circumstances. The period of delay caused by any discrete exceptional events must be subtracted from the total period of delay for the purpose of determining whether the ceiling has been exceeded. Of course, the Crown must always be prepared to mitigate the delay resulting from a discrete exceptional circumstance. So too must the justice system. Within reason, the Crown and the justice system should be capable of prioritizing cases that have faltered due to unforeseen events. See RV Vassal. Thus, any portion of the delay that the Crown and the system could reasonably have mitigated may not be subtracted, i.e., it may not be appropriate to subtract the entire period of delay occasioned by discrete exceptional events. If the remaining delay falls below the ceiling, the accused may still demonstrate in clear cases that the delay is unreasonable as outlined below. If, however, the remaining delay exceeds the ceiling, the delay is unreasonable and a stay of proceedings must be entered. As indicated, 
exceptional circumstances also cover a second category, namely, cases that are particularly complex. This too requires elaboration. Particularly complex cases are cases that, because of the nature of the evidence or the nature of the issues, require an inordinate amount of trial or preparation time such that delay is justified. As for the nature of the evidence, hallmarks of particularly complex cases include voluminous disclosure, a large number of witnesses, significant requirements for expert evidence, and charges covering a long period of time. Particularly complex cases arising from the nature of the issues may be characterized by, among other things, a large number of charges and pretrial applications, novel or complicated legal issues, and a large number of significant issues in dispute. Proceeding jointly against multiple co-accused, so long as it is in the interest of justice to do so, may also impact the complexity of the case. A typical murder trial will not usually be sufficiently complex to comprise an exceptional circumstance. However, if an inordinate amount of trial or preparation time is needed as a result of the nature of the evidence or the issues such that the time the case has taken is justified, the complexity of the case will qualify as presenting an exceptional circumstance. It bears reiterating that such determinations fall well within the trial judge's expertise. And, of course, the trial judge will also want to consider whether the Crown, having initiated what could reasonably be expected to be a complex prosecution, developed and followed a concrete plan to minimize the delay occasioned by such complexity. R. V. Eau at paragraph 2. Where it has failed to do so, the Crown will not be able to show exceptional circumstances because it will not be able to show that the circumstances were outside its control. In a similar vein, and for the same reason, the Crown may wish to consider whether multiple charges for the same conduct, or trying multiple co-accused together, will unduly complicate a proceeding. While the Court plays no supervisory role for such decisions, Crown counsel must be alive to the fact that any delay resulting from their prosecutorial discretion must conform to the accused Section 11 be right. See, for example, Vassal. As this court said in R.V. Rogerson, certainly it is within the Crown's discretion to prosecute charges where the evidence would permit a reasonable jury to convict. However, some semblance of a cost-benefit analysis would serve the justice system well. Where the additional or heightened charges are marginal and pursuing them would necessitate a substantially more complex trial process and jury charge, the Crown should carefully consider whether the public interest would be better served by either declining to prosecute the marginal charges from the outset or deciding not to pursue them once the evidence at trial is complete. Paragraph 45. Where the trial judge finds that the case was particularly complex, such that the time the case has taken is justified, the delay is reasonable and no stay will issue. No further analysis is required. To be clear, the presence of exceptional circumstances is the only basis upon which the Crown can discharge its burden to justify a delay that exceeds the ceiling. As discussed, an exceptional circumstance can arise from a discrete event such as an illness, extradition proceeding, or unexpected event at trial, or from a case's complexity. The seriousness or gravity of the offense cannot be relied on, although the more complex cases will often be those involving serious charges, such as terrorism, organized crime, and gang-related activity. Nor can chronic institutional delay be relied upon. Perhaps most significantly, the absence of prejudice can in no circumstances be used to justify delays after the ceiling is breached. Once so much time has elapsed, only circumstances that are genuinely outside the Crown's control and ability to remedy may furnish a sufficient excuse for the prolonged delay. E. Below the presumptive ceiling. A delay may be unreasonable even if it falls below the presumptive ceiling. If the total delay from the charge to the actual or anticipated end of trial minus defense delay and delay attributable to exceptional circumstances that are discrete in nature is less than 18 months for cases going to trial in the provincial court, or 30 months for cases going to trial in the superior court, then the defense bears the onus to show that the delay is unreasonable. To do so, the defense must establish two things. One, it took meaningful steps that demonstrate a sustained effort to expedite the proceedings, and two, the case took markedly longer than it reasonably should have. Absent these two factors, the Section 11b application must fail. We expect stays beneath the ceiling to be granted only in clear cases. As we have said, in setting the ceiling, we factored in the tolerance for reasonable institutional delay established in Moran, as well as the inherent needs and the increased complexity of most cases. 1. Defense Initiative, Meaningful and Sustained Steps 
To discharge its onus where delay falls below the ceiling, the defense must demonstrate that it took meaningful, sustained steps to expedite the proceedings. Quote, Action or non-action by the accused which is inconsistent with a desire for a timely trial is something that the court must consider, end quote, Moran at page 802. Here, the trial judge should consider what the defense could have done and what it actually did to get the case heard as quickly as possible. Substance matters, not form. To satisfy this criterion, it is not enough for the defense to make token efforts, such as to simply put on the record that it wanted an earlier trial date. Since the defense benefits from a strong presumption in favor of a stay once the ceiling is exceeded, it is incumbent on the defense, in order to justify a stay below the ceiling, to demonstrate having taken meaningful and sustained steps to be tried quickly. While the defense might not be able to resolve the Crown's or the trial court's challenges, it falls to the defense to show that it attempted to set the earliest possible hearing dates, was cooperative with, and responsive to the Crown and the court put the Crown on timely notice when delay was becoming a problem and conducted all applications, including the Section 11B application, reasonably and expeditiously. At the same time, trial judges should not take this opportunity with the benefit of hindsight to question every decision made by the defense. The defense is required to act reasonably, not perfectly. Our colleague Justice Cromwell criticizes this requirement as diminishing the right to be tried within a reasonable time. We respectfully disagree. First, this court already considers defense conduct in assessing Section 11B applications, and the level of diligence displayed by the accused is relevant in the context of other charter rights as well, like the Section 10B right to counsel, R.V. Tremblay, at page 439. Second, as mentioned, the requirement of defense initiative below the ceiling is a corollary to the Crown's justificatory burden above the ceiling. Third, this requirement reflects the practical reality that a level of cooperation between the parties is necessary in planning and conducting a trial. Encouraging the defense to be part of the solution will have positive ramifications not only for the individual cases, but for the entire justice system, thereby enhancing, rather than diminishing, timely justice. 2. Reasonable time requirements of the case, time markedly exceeded. Next, the defense must show that the time the case has taken markedly exceeds the reasonable time requirements of the case. The reasonable time requirements of the case derive from a variety of factors, including the complexity of the case, local considerations, and whether the Crown took reasonable steps to expedite the proceedings. The reasonable time requirements of the case will increase proportionally to a case's complexity. As Justice Sapinka wrote in Moran, quote, All other factors being equal, the more complicated a case, the longer it will take counsel to prepare for trial and for the trial to be conducted once it begins. End quote. Page 791-92. In considering the reasonable time requirements of the case, trial judges should also employ the knowledge they have of their own jurisdiction, including how long a case of that nature typically takes to get to trial in light of the relevant local and systemic circumstances. Where the Crown has done its part to ensure that the matter proceeds expeditiously, including genuinely responding to defense efforts, seeking opportunities to streamline the issues and evidence, and adapting to evolving circumstances as the case progresses, it is unlikely that the reasonable time requirements of the case will have been markedly exceeded. As with assessing the conduct of the defense, trial judges should not hold the Crown to a standard of perfection. Determining whether the time the case has taken markedly exceeds what was reasonably required is not a matter of precise calculation. Trial judges should not parse each day or month, as has been the common practice since Moran, to determine whether each step was reasonably required. Instead, Trial judges should step back from the minutia and adopt a bird's eye view of the case. All this said, this determination is a question of fact falling well within the expertise of the trial judge. Morin, per Justice Sapinka, at paragraph 791-92. F. Applying the new framework to cases already in the system. When this court released its decision in Ascoff, tens of thousands of charges were stayed in Ontario alone as a result of the abrupt change in the law. Such swift and drastic consequences risk undermining the integrity of the administration of justice. We recognize that this new framework is a departure from the law that was applied to Section 11B applications in the past. A judicial change in the law is presumed to operate retroactively and apply to past conduct. Attorney General v. Hislop at paragraph 84. Slightly more relaxed rules apply to judicial changes to the interpretation of constitutional provisions. Paragraph 88. Transition periods, suspended declarations of invalidity, 
and purely prospective remedies are part of the discretionary remedial framework of our constitutional law. Paragraphs 88 to 92. R.V. Bridges at pages 217 to 18. Here, there are a variety of reasons to apply the framework contextually and flexibly for cases currently in the system, one being that it is not fair to strictly judge participants in the criminal justice system against standards of which they had no choice. Further, this new framework creates incentives for both the Crown and the defense to expedite criminal cases. However, in jurisdictions where prolonged delays are the norm, it will take time for these incentives to shift the culture. As well, the administration of justice cannot tolerate a recurrence of what transpired after the release of Askov, and this contextual application of the framework is intended to ensure that the post-Askov situation is not repeated. The new framework, including the presumptive ceiling, applies to cases currently in the system subject to two qualifications. First, for cases in which the delay exceeds the ceiling, a transitional exceptional circumstance may arise where the charges were brought prior to the release of this decision. This transitional exceptional circumstance will apply when the Crown satisfies the court that the time the case has taken is justified based on the party's reasonable reliance on the law as it previously existed. This requires a contextual assessment sensitive to the manner in which the previous framework was applied and the fact that the party's behavior cannot be judged strictly against a standard of which they had no choice. For example, prejudice and the seriousness of the offense often played a decisive role in whether delay was unreasonable under the previous framework. For cases currently in the system, these considerations can therefore inform whether the party's reliance on the previous state of the law was reasonable. Of course, if the parties have had time following the release of this decision to correct their behavior and the system has had some time to adapt, the trial judge should take this into account. Moreover, the delay may exceed the ceiling because the case is of moderate complexity in a jurisdiction with significant institutional delay problems. Judges in jurisdictions plagued by lengthy, persistent, and notoriously institutional delays should account for this reality, as Crown Council's behavior is constrained by systemic delay issues. Parliament, the legislatures, and Crown Council need time to respond to this decision and stays of proceedings cannot be granted en masse simply because problems of institutional delay currently exist. As we have said, the administration of justice cannot countenance a recurrence of Askoff. This transitional exceptional circumstance recognizes that change takes time, and institutional delay, even if it is significant, will not automatically result in a stay of proceedings. On the other hand, the Section 11b rights of all accused persons cannot be held in abeyance while the system works to respond to this new framework. Section 11b breaches will still be found and stays of proceedings will still be entered for cases currently in the system. For example, if the delay in a simple case vastly exceeds the ceiling because of repeated mistakes or missteps by the Crown, the delay might be unreasonable even though the parties were operating under the previous framework. The analysis must always be contextual. We rely on the good sense of trial judges to determine the reasonableness of the delay in the circumstances of each case. The second qualification applies to cases currently in the system in which the total delay minus defense delay falls below the ceiling. For these cases, the two criteria, defense initiative and whether the time the case has taken markedly exceeds what was reasonably required, must also be applied contextually, sensitive to the party's reliance on the previous state of the law. Specifically, the defense need not demonstrate having taken initiative to expedite matters for the period of delay preceding this decision. Since defense initiative was not expressly required by the Moran framework, it would be unfair to require it for the period of time before the release of this decision. However, in closed cases, any defense initiative during that time would assist the defense in showing that the delay markedly exceeds what was reasonably required. The trial judge must also still consider action or inaction by the accused that may be inconsistent with a desire for a timely trial. Moran at page 802. Further, if the delay was occasioned by an institutional delay that was reasonably acceptable in the relevant jurisdiction under the Moran framework before this decision was released, that institutional delay will be a component of the reasonable time requirements of the case for cases currently in the system. We note that given the level of institutional delay tolerated under the previous approach, a stay of proceedings below the ceiling will be even more difficult to obtain for cases currently in the system. We also emphasize that for cases in which the charge is brought shortly after the release of this decision, the reasonable time requirements of the case must reflect this high level of tolerance for institutional delay in particular localities. Ultimately, for most cases that are already in the system, 
the release of this decision should not automatically transform what would previously have been considered a reasonable delay into an unreasonable one. Change takes time. In his dissenting opinion in Mills and the Queen, Justice Lemaire, as he then was, was alive to this concern and his comments are opposite here. This case is the first to have presented this court with the opportunity of establishing appropriate guidelines for the application of Section 11b. The full scope of the section, and the nature of the obligations it has imposed upon the government and the courts, has remained uncertain for the period prior to the rendering of this decision. Given this uncertainty and the terminative nature of the remedy for a violation of the section, i.e., a stay of proceedings, I am of the view that a transitional approach is appropriate, and indeed necessary, to enable the courts and the governments to properly discharge their burden under Section 11b. This is not to say that different criteria ought to apply during the transitional period, that is, the period prior to the rendering of this decision, but rather that the behavior of the accused and the authorities must be evaluated in its proper context. In other words, it would be inaccurate to give effect to behavior which occurred prior to this judgment against a standard the parameters of which were unknown to all. Page 948. We echo Justice Lemire's remarks. For cases already in the system, the presumptive ceiling still applies. However, quote, the behavior of the accused and the authorities, unquote, which is an important consideration in the new framework, quote, must be evaluated in its proper context, unquote. Mills, page 948. The reasonableness of a period of time to prosecute a case takes its color from the surrounding circumstances. Reliance on the law as it then stood is one such circumstance. We disagree with Justice Cromwell, that our framework's allowance for present reality somehow creates a charter amnesty. For cases currently in the system, the Section 11b right will receive no less protection than it does now. The point is that, on an ongoing basis, our framework has the potential to affect positive change within the justice system, rather than succumb to the culture of complacency we have described. G. Concluding Comments on the New Framework The new framework for Section 11b can be summarized as follows. There is a ceiling beyond which delay becomes presumptively unreasonable. The presumptive ceiling is 18 months for cases tried in the provincial court and 30 months for cases in the superior court, or cases tried in the provincial court after a preliminary inquiry. Defense delay does not count towards the presumptive ceiling. Once the presumptive ceiling is exceeded, the burden shifts to the Crown to rebut the presumption of unreasonableness on the basis of exceptional circumstances. Exceptional circumstances lie outside the Crown's control in that 1. They are reasonably unforeseen or reasonably unavoidable, and 2. They cannot reasonably be remedied. If the exceptional circumstance relates to a discrete event, the delay reasonably attributable to that event is subtracted. If the exceptional circumstance arises from the case's complexity, the delay is reasonable. Below the presumptive ceiling, in clear cases, the defense may show that the delay is unreasonable. To do so, the defense must establish two things. One, it took meaningful steps that demonstrate a sustained effort to expedite the proceedings, and two, the case took markedly longer than it reasonably should have. For cases currently in the system, the framework must be applied flexibly and contextually, with due sensitivity to the party's reliance on the previous state of the law. As part of the process of developing this framework, we conducted a qualitative review of nearly every reported Section 11b appellate decision from the past 10 years and many decisions from trial courts. These cases assisted in developing the definition of exceptional circumstances as they highlighted the types of circumstances that judges have found to justify prolonged delays. By reading these cases with the new framework in mind, we were able to get a rough sense of how the new framework would have played out in some past cases. Indeed, we note that in the seminal case of Askoff, the delay was in the range of 30 months as it was in Godden some 19 years later, and in both cases, this court found the delays to be unreasonable. It is also clear from this case law review that the ceiling will not permit the parties or the courts to operate business as usual. The ceiling is designed to encourage conduct and the allocation of resources that promote timely trials. The jurisprudence from the past decade demonstrate that the current approach to Section 11b does not encourage good behavior. Finger pointing is more common than problem solving. This body of decisions make it clear that the incentives inherent in the status quo fall short in the ways we have described. We acknowledge that this new framework represents a significant shift from past practice. First, its standpoint is perspective. Participants in the criminal justice system will know, in advance, the bounds of reasonableness so proactive measures can be taken to remedy any delay, and the public will more clearly understand what it means to hold a trial within a reasonable time. 
Enhanced clarity and predictability benefits a charter right of such fundamental importance to our criminal justice system. Second, the new framework resolves the difficulties surrounding the concept of prejudice. Instead of being an express analytical factor, the concept of prejudice underpins the entire framework. Prejudice is accounted for in the creation of the ceiling. It also has a strong relationship with the defense initiative in that we can expect accused persons who are truly prejudiced to be proactive in moving the matter along. Prejudice has been one of the most fraught areas of Section 11B jurisprudence for over two decades. Understanding prejudice as informing the setting of the ceiling rather than treating prejudice as an express analytical factor also better recognizes that, as we have said, prolonged delays cause prejudice to not just specific accused persons, but also victims, witnesses, and the system of justice as a whole. Third, the new framework reduces, although does not eliminate, the need to engage in complicated micro-counting. While judges will still have to determine defense delay, the inquiry beneath the ceiling into whether the case took markedly longer than it reasonably should have replaces the micro-counting process with a global assessment. This inquiry need only arise if the accused has taken meaningful and sustained steps to expedite matters, and above the ceiling, a Section 11b analysis is triggered only when the Crown seeks to rely on exceptional circumstances. A framework that is simpler to apply is itself of value. Quote, we must remind ourselves that the best test will be relatively easy to apply. Otherwise, stay applications themselves will contribute to the already heavy load on trial judges and compound the problem of delay. Unquote. Morin, for Justice McLaughlin, at page 810. In addition, the new framework will help facilitate a much-needed shift in culture. In creating incentives for both sides, it seeks to enhance accountability by fostering proactive, preventative problem-solving. From the Crown's perspective, the framework clarifies the content of the accused's ever-present constitutional obligation to bring the accused to trial within a reasonable time. Above the ceiling, the Crown will only be able to discharge its burden if it can show that it should not be held accountable for the circumstances which caused the ceiling to be breached because they were genuinely outside its control. Crown counsel will be motivated to act proactively throughout the proceedings to preserve its ability to justify a delay that exceeds the ceiling, should the need arise. Below the ceiling, a diligent, proactive crown will be a strong indication that the case did not take markedly longer than reasonably necessary. The new framework also encourages the defense to be part of the solution. If an accused brings a Section 11b application when the total delay, minus defense delay, and delay attributable to exceptional circumstances that are discrete in nature, falls below the ceiling, the defense must demonstrate that it took meaningful and sustained steps to expedite the proceedings as a prerequisite to a stay. Further, the deduction of defense delay from total delay as a starting point in the analysis clearly indicates that the defense cannot benefit from its own delay causing action or inaction. The new framework makes courts more accountable too. Absent exceptional circumstances, the ceiling limits the extent to which judges can tolerate delays before a stay must be imposed. Indeed, courts are important players in changing courtroom culture. Many courts have developed robust case management and trial scheduling processes, focusing attention on possible sources of delay such as pretrial applications or unrealistic estimates of trial length, and thereby seeking to avoid or minimize unnecessary delay. Some courts, however, have not. As we have said, this court also has a role to play. On many occasions, this court has established detailed guidelines and minimum requirements to give meaningful content to constitutional rights in the criminal law context. See, for example, R. V. Fearon at paragraph 83, Lavallee, Rackle, and Heinz in Canada, at paragraph 49, Canada and the Federation of Law Societies of Canada, at paragraphs 53 to 56. Section 11b has received its content in much the same way. Justice Cromwell's framework, like ours and like Moran and Askoff, is entirely judicially created, and like ours and like Moran and Askoff, it relies heavily on numerical guidelines, with such guidelines acting as guideposts, not absolute limitation periods. Our approach is entirely consistent with the judicial role. Ultimately, all participants in this justice system must work in concert to achieve speedier trials. After all, everyone stands to benefit from these efforts. As Justice Sharp wrote in R.V. Omar, 2007, Ontario Court of Appeal 117, the judicial system, like all other public institutions, has limited resources at its disposal, as do the litigants and legal aid. It is in the interests of all constituencies those accused of crimes, the police, Crown Counsel, Defence Counsel, and judges both at trial and on appeal to make the most of the limited resources at our disposal. Paragraph 32. Justice Sharp's reference to finite resources is an important point. 
we are aware that resource issues are rarely far below the surface of most Section 11B applications. By encouraging all justice system participants to be more proactive, some resource issues will naturally be resolved because parties will be encouraged to eliminate or avoid inefficient practices. At the same time, the new framework implicates the sufficiency of resources by reminding legislators and ministers that unreasonable delay in bringing accused persons to trial is not merely contrary to the public interest, it is constitutionally impermissible and will be treated as such. Application to this case Having established the new framework for Section 11b, we now turn to the case before us. The first step in determining whether Mr. Jordan's Section 11b right was infringed is to determine the total delay between the charges and the end of trial. In this case, the total delay was 49.5 months. Turning to the first case-specific factor that must be accounted for, the next step is to determine whether any of that delay was waived or caused solely by the defense. We see no reason to interfere with the trial judge's finding that four months of this delay were waived by Mr. Jordan when he changed counsel shortly before the trial was set to begin, necessitating an adjournment. The more difficult assessment is whether any of the remaining delay was caused solely by the action or inaction of the defense. The Crown argues that the trial judge erred by failing to attribute significant periods of delay to the defense and that the defense was equally culpable in the delay in bringing this matter to trial. The Crown cited several examples. The defense consented to numerous adjournments. Defense counsel initially suggested the four-day estimate for the preliminary inquiry. Defense counsel's unavailability resulted in the preliminary inquiry not being completed as scheduled in December 2010. Defense counsel failed to respond to the Crown's offer in July 2011 of an earlier trial, and there was no evidence that defense counsel would have been available for trial earlier than June 2012. While these instances that the Crown points to are symptomatic of the systemic complacency towards delay that we have described, most of them are not attributable solely to the defense. The Crown and Defense both share responsibility for the preliminary inquiry under estimation. Similarly, responsibility for the delay resulting from consent adjournments and the Defense's failure to respond to the Crown's offer of a shorter trial time in July 2011 should not be borne solely by the Defense. These adjournments were part of the legitimate procedural requirements of the case, and it does not appear from the record that any occurred when the Crown and Court were otherwise ready to proceed. Further, there was no evidence that had the defense responded to the Crown's offer of an earlier trial, the Crown and the court would have been able to accommodate an earlier date. Rather, the only evidence before the trial judge was that the earliest available trial dates were in September 2012. The defense should, however, bear responsibility for the delay resulting from the adjournment of the preliminary inquiry necessitated by defense counsel's unavailability for closing submissions on December 22, 2010, the last day scheduled for the preliminary inquiry. We would only attribute one and a half months of that delay to the defense. However, given the evidence that Crown Counsel was unable to attend at the first available continuation date for the preliminary inquiry of February 3, 2011. In total then, four months of delay were waived by the defense and one and a half months of delay were caused solely by the defense. This leaves a remaining delay of 44 months, an amount that vastly exceeds the presumptive ceiling of 30 months in the Superior Court. The burden is therefore on the Crown to demonstrate that the delay is reasonable in light of exceptional circumstances. There is nothing in the record to indicate that any discrete exceptional circumstances arose, and although particularly complex cases may present an exceptional circumstance, this is not one of those cases. In terms of the legal issues, while Mr. Jordan was initially charged along with nine other co-accused, this number quickly dropped as the case progressed. At the time of trial, only one co-accused remained on the indictment with Mr. Jordan. Further, None of the alleged offenses involved novel or complex points of law. Relatively few pretrial applications were scheduled. In short, the legal issues in Mr. Jordan's case were not particularly complex. As for the evidence, it was substantial but it was relatively straightforward. It consisted of surveillance evidence by police officers, undercover buys by police officers, a small amount of expert evidence regarding how dial-a-dope operations are conducted, and a search warrant for Mr. Jordan's apartment. There is nothing particularly complex about this evidence. In the end, while the case against Mr. Jordan may have been moderately complex given the amount of evidence and the number of co-accused, it was not so exceptionally complex that it would justify a delay of 44 months, excluding defense delay. However, since Mr. Jordan's charges were brought prior to the release of this decision, we must also consider whether the transitional exceptional circumstance justifies the delay. In our view, it does not. We recognize that the Crown was operating without notice of this change in the law within a jurisdiction with some systemic delay issues. 
but a total delay of 44 months, excluding defense delay, of which the vast majority was either crown or institutional delay in an ordinary dial dope trafficking prosecution is simply unreasonable regardless of the framework under which the crown was operating. Therefore, it cannot be said that the crown's reliance on the previous state of the law was reasonable. We note that a good portion of the delay resulted from the inaccurate assessment of the time required for the preliminary inquiry, and in particular, the Crown's failure to communicate with the parties with a view to tying down the evidence that it needed to call at the preliminary inquiry. A similar problem occurred with the trial. While the fault for the delay in bringing this matter to trial certainly did not lie solely with Crown counsel, it is equally clear that the Crown prosecutors assigned to the case did not have a solid plan for bringing the matter to trial within a reasonable time. The Crown was aware of potential Section 11B issues as early as December 2010, yet it took few steps to expedite the matter. Instead, the Crown was content to rely on an overly large estimate of trial time without attempting to streamline the issues or consider severing the co-accused from the indictment. The Crown did make a good faith effort to bring the matter to trial more quickly in light of the Section 11B issues when Crown Counsel wrote to Defense Counsel in July 2011 with a revised estimate of the length of the Crown's case. But by this point, approximately 31 months had already elapsed from the date of Mr. Jordan's charges. This is a substantial length of time to wait before making efforts to expedite the matter. At this point, the scheduled trial was still more than a year away. While the Crown did make some efforts to bring the matter to trial more quickly, these efforts were too little and too late. The previous state of the law cannot reasonably support the Crown's conduct, and the systemic delay problems that existed in the Surrey Provincial Court at the time cannot justify the delay either. As discussed, much of the institutional delay could have been avoided had the Crown proceeded on the basis of a more reasonable plan. To the extent that the trial judge held that this delay was reasonable under the Morin framework, he erred citing the Court of Appeals decision in R. V. Gavani at paragraph 52, he incorrectly held that institutional delay is entitled to less weight than delay within the Crown's control. The parties agree that this was an error. It follows that the delay was unreasonable and Mr. Jordan's Section 11b right was infringed. Conclusion The right to a trial within a reasonable time has aptly been described as, quote, discipline for the justice system, unquote, in that it may cause, quote, discomfort in the short term, but it will bring achievement in the long term, unquote. Code, pages 133 to 34. In this case, the system was undisciplined. It failed. Mr. Jordan's Section 11b right was breached, and when it took 49.5 months to bring him to trial, all the parties were operating within the culture of complacency towards delay that has pervaded the criminal justice system in recent years. There is simply no reasonable explanation for why the matter took as long as it did. The appeal must be allowed, the conviction set aside, and a stay of proceedings entered. We agree with Justice Cromwell that our differences of opinion are indeed fundamental. In our view, given the considerable doctrinal and practical problems confronting the Moran approach, further minor refinements to the model are incapable of responding to the challenges facing timely justice in this country. Real change will require the efforts and coordination of all participants in the criminal justice system. For Crown Counsel, this means making reasonable and responsible decisions regarding who to prosecute and for what, delivering on their disclosure obligations promptly with the cooperation of police, creating plans for complex prosecutions, and using court time efficiently. It may also require enhanced Crown discretion for resolving individual cases. For Defense Counsel, this means actively advancing their client's right to a trial within a reasonable time, collaborating with Crown Counsel when appropriate, and like Crown Counsel, using court time efficiently. Both parties should focus on making reasonable admissions, streamlining the evidence, and anticipating issues that need to be resolved in advance. For the courts, this means implementing more efficient procedures, including scheduling practices. Trial courts may wish to review their case management regimes to ensure that they provide the tools for parties to collaborate and conduct cases efficiently. Trial judges should make reasonable efforts to control and manage the conduct of trials. Appellate courts must support these efforts by affording deference to case management choices made by courts below. All courts, including this court, must be mindful of the impact of their decisions on the conduct of trials. For provincial legislatures and parliament, this may mean taking a fresh look at rules, procedures, and other areas of the criminal law to ensure that they are more conducive to timely justice and that the criminal process focuses on what is truly necessary to a fair trial. Legal aid has a role to play in securing the participation of experienced defense counsel, particularly for long, complex trials. 
and Parliament may wish to consider the value of preliminary inquiries in light of expanded disclosure obligations. Government will also need to consider whether the criminal justice system and any initiatives aimed at reducing delay is adequately resourced. Thus, broader structural and procedural changes in addition to day-to-day efforts are required to maintain the public's confidence by delivering justice in a timely manner. Timely trials are possible. More than that, they are constitutionally required. Thanks for the listen, friend. I hope you're able to enjoy that case and learn something new from it. Legal Listening is founded by Zach Battiston and Carly Lyons. It is hosted by Zach Battiston, Carly Lyons, and you, our listeners. Executive produced by Zach Battiston, Carly Lyons, and Anthony Rademeyer. Audio engineering by Anthony Rademeyer. Graphic design by Julie Lindy. Check her out online at julielindyart.com. And music done by Matt Rademeyer at radandkel.com. At Legal Listening, we're always open to new ideas, suggestions, and of course, guest readers. Check us out on Twitter at Legal Listening or online at LegalListening.com. Legal Listening, where audio obiter is our thing. We'll catch you in the next case. Bye now.